Welcome to the third Leadership Lab this quarter, hosted by the Emerging Leaders Initiative in the Division of Social Sciences. My name is Bart van Wassenhoven. As some of you may know, I'm the coordinator of the Emerging Leaders Initiative. Um, today's workshop is part of an ongoing series of professional development workshops for doctoral candidates and doctoral students focusing on the skills that PhDs need to build successful careers both inside and outside the academy. And today we will focus on the ins and outs of the academic hiring process and address questions about current trends in the academic job market, how job applications are evaluated, and how you can be successful at interviews and campus visits. Um, in the next hour and 15 minutes, we'll explore these questions and we'll also definitely give you enough time to, um, to ask any additional questions you may have at the end. Um, before we get started, I just want to mention two of our upcoming events. We have two big events coming up later this month. On the 15th, so two weeks from now, we will have our third annual career day. So that's going to be a half-day conference about um, career, career diversity for social scientists. So we will have three panels there one on navigating job listings, one on negotiating job offers, and then the last one will be a panel with nine alumni from the division in different fields who will talk about their professional experiences and how you can get the kinds of jobs that they are in. Um, so that is on the 15th, um, I believe from nine to one. And then on the 29th, we will have our student research conference at which students from all over the division will present the research that they've undertaken um, with grants funded by the division. And we have a, a very exciting lineup of titles and subjects there. So I encourage you all to, uh, to stop by, even if you can't make it for the whole day. We will go from 9 to 5. But if you want to stop by for one panel or a couple of talks, I would very much encourage you um, to do that. We will be in um, Sayy Hall for that event. OK, so without further ado, I um, like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about their experiences with academic job searches and, and what brings them here. So sure, I'll start. Uh, so I'm Ethan Porter. I'm a PhD candidate in political science. Uh, I have never been on the job market, but this past fall I was roped into serving on two hiring committees in the department. Uh, so I got to peek behind the curtain a little bit and uh, learn a little bit about the job market experience from the hiring perspective. Um, I'm Ken Pomeranz. I'm the chair of the Department of History. Um, so I have, for the last more years than I care to admit, mostly been on the hiring side of the job market. Um, I'm also past president of the American Historical Association, and so we did a lot of research on what's going on in our job market in particular, so I have some insights from that. Hi, I'm Alessandra Voina. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Economics. I went on the job market four years ago uh, as a um, PhD student. I got my first job here. Uh, I deferred the offer by a year to take a postdoc. Um, and then now I've been there at Chicago for three years. And every year since I started, I've been on the junior search uh, committee. So I've had at least mm -hmm. some chance to see both uh, sides of the market uh, in the past few years. So I was thinking we could start on a very big picture level um, and think a little bit about current trends in the academic job market. We got one question, so when I am um, on the website, I asked people when they signed up to um, give me a couple of pointers about what they were interested in hearing, and uh, a couple of people were interested in hearing trends of the job market. We all know that since the financial crisis, there's been um, some difficulties with the job market, and some people are wondering, is the job market going to rebound? Is the current landscape here to stay? Or are there any changes that we can expect? And if so, how can we best adapt ourselves to those changes and to the way the landscape is evolving. So Ken, maybe you would... Okay, so the job market, as you all know, is tough. Um, there are surprising pockets. Um, certain things remain very robust. Um, but those tend to be either things that have a particular story behind them, right? So. My field of Chinese history is relatively good right now because everybody's interested in China. Um, Japan, which was the hot field when I was on the job market, is not doing very well. Um, I think we have to prepare ourselves for the likelihood in general that the job market isn't going to rebound, right? That unlike past recessions where a downturn was followed by a frenzy of hiring afterwards. The environment at particularly most of the public universities is that 
they're just not going to replace a lot of these people when they they retire, or they will replace them with adjuncts. Um, you know, that's not to say that I expect things to go down, 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 down. I think you know, we are probably pretty close to bottom, but I'm not saying that I necessarily think we're going <clears> to <throat> come back up very much either. Um, one thing that I think people will need to think about a lot is there are depending on your point of view, either relatively promising or difficult subsectors of the job economy of the job market that are growing. So more and more schools, especially public institutions, are offering these hybrid jobs where you're partly in administration or student <coughs> services or something and partly teaching, but there is a tenured component to them. Um, more and more places again, especially less elite institutions, are offering jobs where part of your teaching is online. So one of the things that people will have to think about is, is that within the universe of jobs that I'm interested in? Um, because particularly if you've been at UNC where we don't do much of that sort of stuff, if you want to pursue those jobs, it's going to be a real effort. You're going to have to teach yourself a bunch of things you don't know. And if you're not so sure you're going to want that kind of job anyway, it might well be you know, make more sense just to write it off to begin with. Um, so the job market's changing in all sorts of ways. There are pockets of growth, both <clears throat> traditional and non-traditional. And part of what you have to figure out is, do those pockets of growth interest me? So, Alessandro, do you think that picture holds for economics as well? Do you see a similar evolution? Well, the job market in economics uh, was hit uh, quite strongly by the recession early on. Uh, but and certainly hasn't picked up back to where to where it was. But I think that uh, the picture overall um, is still relatively. Uh, I'm not gonna say rosy, <laughs> but at least um, <coughs> at least promising for um, for students who want to find academic jobs. I think though it's still very important to keep a, an open mind about applying possibly outside of the United States, for example, where. There's been tremendous growth in uh, interest in hiring in the international market. Uh, so I'm, I'm from Europe. A lot of European institutions are flying all the way to the AEA meetings to interview European candidates who have also flown over there, or no, or interview American candidates. So, and I think I think that's true for other par um, parts of the world as well. And so, if I think if you're committed to your research and to pursuing it. Um, you might want to consider applying on a very broad geographic uh, spectrum. Right, I think that brings us to another another question I received, which is, um, given that the landscape is nowhere near as uniform as it used to be, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of people are worrying, should I apply all out, as the phrase goes, right? Should I apply for tenure track jobs, um, postdocs, temporary jobs, adjuncting positions, or should I, or does it make sense in, in some um, cases to focus on maybe one type of job and does it and another question I receive is does it uh, make sense to apply for tenure track jobs when you're still finishing your dissertation you don't have your degree in hand well <clears throat> in political science uh, I mean, it's, it's idiosyncratic by subfield but certainly the expectation is that uh, people that the sort of top candidates will apply while ABD uh, in those in other candidates will obviously apply as well who've you know already received their dissertation uh, or receive their degree. Um, but I, I do think there's great variation dependent on subfield. Um, that said, it seems almost all candidates that we looked at seriously had applied to every single possible place. So even candidates at the very top of the market who were competing for the very top jobs had applied literally to every place imaginable that you'd ever heard of. So at least in political science, it seems that the, 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 the common wisdom is apply everywhere <coughs> because you never know what's gonna happen. Yeah, I would say apply everywhere that you can imagine going, right? I mean, if there are some things that are just out for you, then obviously don't, don't waste your time. Um, but other than that, I would say, yes, apply broadly. It's a little different. I mean, sometimes people apply you know, when they're nowhere near finished, figuring I'll get a little bit of job market experience. And if you're doing that, 
then no, you don't want to apply everywhere. You want to apply just enough <clears throat> to get some experience. Because the last thing in the world you want is to get offered the job that you don't really want, but you take as a last resort when you're nowhere near finished. Because then you risk, assuming that one of the features of that job you don't really want is a very heavy teaching load, then you risk getting sucked into that place and never being able to get out. Um, but <clears throat> assuming you're not at that early stage, that you're, you know, you're well launched and you're going to need a job soon, then I would say apply to, apply to anything you can imagine taking. Yeah, absolutely second that, that view. Um, yes, with the marginal cost of applying to one more school should be, should be quite low. At the same time, um, at least for, for in economics, typically you don't personalize your application at all to the place you're applying to, by and large. But there might be cases, and this is what we were advised to do, if, uh, if you're applying to a school that you particularly like, where you think you might, they might think you wouldn't be especially interested in going, say, because they find you possibly too good or too uh, qualified, but you have personal idiosyncratic reason for wanting to go there, you can try to use your cover letter or some way of uh, signaling that you're serious about uh, the application. Because that's obviously on the, on the demand side, schools are going to ask themselves, do I actually stand a chance to mm -hmm. hire this person? And every interview slot uh, is valuable. And so that's, that's also something useful to keep in mind. I also, <coughs> one thing that uh, came to mind is that, <coughs> that w when you go on the market, uh, should, I think, in my, what I, what I observed, it should be largely responsive to what your advisor tells you. Uh, we had two very strong candidates, just based on their CVs, whose letters from their chairs said this person is not ready to be on the job market. Mm -hmm. um, this person does not have a dissertation that will be ready, you know, or acceptable enough. Uh, so if your advisor is squeamish or skeptical or, or explicitly tells you not to go on the job market, don't go on the job market. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they, yeah. Hard to argue with that yeah. one. <laughs> um, one thing I would add, I mean, coming from a field where personalizing um, your job application to particular um, campuses is more common, um, I think it can actually become a kind of fetish that gets that sucks up too much of your time. So no, you don't want to write exactly the same letter mm -hmm. for Johns Hopkins that you write for you know, Henderson County Junior College. Um, but you also don't want to spend enormous amounts of time second guessing, um, you know, minute variations in the schools that you're um, applying to, in part because you don't, you don't actually know very much about the self-image of any of these schools, um, which can be radically different even within what looks to us like a similar class. Um, I remember years ago when I was on the job market, two <coughs> small and not very prestigious liberal arts colleges where I got interviews. And one of them, it was clear within five minutes that this was a place where people came and their, their research careers were over, right? You came, you were going to teach your heart out and they didn't care if you published. You know, if you were a decent teacher, you were gonna get tenure and that was, that was life in this place. Another place demographically very, very similar. But I walked into the interview. All the people interviewing me were <clears throat> assistant and um, recently tenured associates, all from elite schools. And the first thing they actually said to me is, we really, really hope you come. We're one vote short of a majority. We're about to take over this department. <laughs> and you know, the old guys who don't care about research, their days are numbered. <laughs> and there was no way you could have told from the catalog mm -hmm. that that difference existed. So I wouldn't try to spend mm -hmm. too much time psychologizing in advance. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are any general principles that apply for when, for example, you apply to research one university versus a large state school or a liberal arts college? I mean, my guess would be that for a liberal arts college, you would emphasize your teaching experience a lot more, and for a research one university, of course, 
talk more about your dissertation. Um, are there any other considerations that should go into into the application materials? Um, I would say one thing, maybe at the application materials stage, but certainly at the interview stage, if you get that far, is make sure you know what this what this department does and what things they don't do, right? So if you are, let's say, again, you're within my own field, if you're a historian of Mexico and you see that none of the U.S. historians in this department do Chicano history and you feel competent to do that, then by all means throw that in. Um, at another school where they may well have that covered, you know, no point to doing it. Um, so think about what the school already does, you know, where they're, is it a place that has, for instance, a medical school that's much stronger than the, than the general undergraduate college? If so, it might be a place where so-called medical humanities or healthcare economics or whatever would appeal. Now, try to get some sense of, you know, of what this school does. Yeah, and definitely at the interview stage, uh, I don't know if we're moving mm -hmm. towards, mm -hmm. towards that, but um, just following up on, uh, on this uh, latest point. The interview stage, you want to go into your interview being very prepared about the school that you're talking to. Um, first of all, for instance, you can definitely ask, uh, if possible, whether there's a list of the faculty. At least, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm talking primarily about my experience in economics, so please correct me mm -hmm. if this doesn't apply to, to other fields. But you want to know who is going to be in the room, and you want to know whether your work is related uh, to the one of people who are going to be to be sitting there. I think uh, I think taking the interview stage very seriously is uh, is of paramount uh, importance and preparing hard both in your general interview skills but also in the specifics of that interview room is going to pay off. So, yeah. uh, One thing I'd add there is even before the interview stage, at the cover letter stage, and I think this applies for almost any institution, maybe not for the very, very top ones, but for almost any other, is bear in mind that the people who will dominate the decision to hire you are probably not experts in your field, right? right? So again, to use history as an example, right? if they're hiring a Latin Americanist, at most places it's because they don't have one or they're down to one, their other one retired. And so most of the people who will be voting on hiring you are people who do you know, medieval Europe or 20th century Japan or the presidency of Andrew Jackson, and your work has to be legible to them, right? So as much as you want to emphasize you know, what's cutting edge and exciting and makes your work different from anybody else in your subfield, even more important, I think, in the job process is making sure that the person who's not in your subfield can see why the problem is important. And that can, I think, sometimes be as simple uh, as instead of saying, my dissertation disproves the Wiener hypothesis, right, which is going to mean nothing to somebody who's not in your subfield, rephrasing that as the consensus in my field has been blah. I'm going to show not blah, right? And that's much more likely to mean something to the, the person who's not in your subfield, and they're going to have most of the votes. Yeah, so it's interesting. The, 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 the sort of the two biggest duds we brought out, uh, one candidate uh, worked directly overlapped with a prominent member of the department on the committee, and uh, the candidate did not cite or engage this person's work, despite you know this person's work being seminal. That was an enormous mistake, and certainly cost the candidate really any shot of getting the job. On the other hand, another candidate came out, uh, and uh, his work overlapped with no one. 
uh, and he made no attempt to sell it whatsoever to anybody who's you know to who's not him, which means he made no attempt to sell it to people, the entire department, and he also flopped. So the point is, if your work overlaps in any way with, with faculty members, you should probably figure that out and be sure to cite them in your job market paper, in your talk, et cetera. Pretend to have read their work. On the other <laughs> hand, at the least, right? On the other hand, uh, like, if you're doing something very technical, uh, you know, if you're doing something that, that requires a degree of expertise that the vast majority of people in the audience don't have, you really need to just sort of lay out the basic stakes of your research in a way that senior faculty members who haven't been paying attention to research for 20 years can you know understand in a way that you know younger faculty members who do some entirely different work can understand uh, you know it, it shouldn't it, I don't know it, it seems silly to have to say that but you know you're, you're, you're selling a good right in some basic way and the, the, the potential customers are these people some of whom you're gonna have some stuff in common with but the vast majority of whom are going to do work pretty distinct from your own yeah. Try out your um, your dissertation abstract, your cover letter, etc., on somebody outside your department. Mm -hmm. You know, if your roommate's from the law school, run it past him or her. Um, if your partner is in a different field, run it past them. Um, you really, you really, being legible to the non-specialist is just so crucial. Right. I'm going to interject there, maybe, that there's a lot of resources at Graduate Student Affairs to help with that. I know that at least every year, if not a couple of years, they do workshops on elevator speeches where you get a chance to practice how to describe your dissertation in about the two or three minutes um, that it would take to get somewhere in the elevator. Um, they also do mock interviews, so there's a lot of this stuff, I think, that you can practice beforehand in first of all, a safe context, I think, a context where there's nothing at stake, and also a context, um, I think, in which you are talking to someone who's not in your field, who's not even academic, right? So I think there's a lot of great resources that can help with that piece of just sort of crafting and fine-tuning your message before you actually have to go into the high-stakes um, game of, of selling yourself, as we, as we put it. Um, so the title for the workshop today is The Ins and Outs of the Academic Hiring Process, and I wanted to talk a little bit about hiring as a process so I think for a lot of us when we submit an application right either we will hear back or we will not hear back but we never quite know unless we've been on the other side as Ethan has what is going on once you've submitted your application so I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit about what happens when all these hundred or more applications <laughs> land on someone's desk um. and and specifically maybe what is going to make the difference between someone who is long-listed, someone who is short-listed, and what goes into that decision? Uh, so this is actually, to me, the, the sort of the most, the, 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 the thing that left me most optimistic uh, was that I'd been told, look, look, you know, in American politics, which is what I specialize in, uh, what matters is you go to a good school, you get some publications, and you have good recommendations, and you'll get a job. Uh, and, you know, there's always, like, is, that, is it really that straightforward? And it turns out it sort of is, right? Now, I don't think this is true across all fields and across all subfields, but, uh, you know, there's a pile of 200 applications and you sort of say, okay, well, uh, do these people have publications or do they have R&Rs somewhere? Great, they're in this pile. Okay, how are their letters? You go through their letters. Well, how are their letters, right? And then uh, some people have really extraordinary letters, right? Uh, and they're in, a, they're in a final pile. Uh, and, and then, you know, sort of what goes from the long list to the short list, in, in large part, at least in our case, is dependent uh, almost entirely on the sort of idiosyncratic needs of the department, right? So, you know, there were eight stellar candidates whom, you know, by CV and by recommendation uh, were, you know, virtually indistinguishable, but, you know, we only ended up bringing out three or four because we had very sort of specific departmental needs that some could fulfill. So it may, you know, it was, it was meritocratic, you know, in some sense, uh, up until the, the very end when it really depended on the department's needs. I would also say that the, the, the thing that shocked me, though, about this process um, was the degree to which letters are not letters of recommendation. This is sort of the thing that I, I always tell people about my experiences on the committees. Uh, I'd always assumed, and I think that, I don't think my department did a good job of explaining that letters are not letters of recommendation in the same way that you might get a letter of recommendation for a job or something like that. Letters are peer-to-peer -peer assessments of one's scholarly potential. Uh, so when letters are very blunt. Uh, and, and very candid, so they can be extremely helpful in discerning, you know, different candidates. Uh, but 
that, that was the big shocker that, you know, turns out that not all letters are, are good. <laughs> Certainly not all are equally good. Yeah. I mean, a couple things along those lines. I mean, the problem, of course, is that your letters are extremely important and you don't write them, yeah. right? So your control is limited in that sense. However, A, the good news is your letters are going to come on University of Chicago stationery, and that is a very good thing because as much as people might deny it, yes, it matters. Um, you know, matters a whole lot. The other thing, though, is that to a certain extent, and I don't want to overdo this, but to a certain extent you can manage what is in your letters by managing what it is you give your advisor. Right? So if you're applying at a point, you know, if you think that the really exciting chapter of your dissertation is chapter four, but so far what you've given the dissertation advisor is the first three chapters that kind of set up the problem and clear the ground and so forth, but aren't the part that's really exciting, make sure you have at least talked to your advisor about what's going to be in chapter four so that he or she can say something about that. They're going to need to explain what the payoff is. Um, especially since, you know, at the preliminary stage, usually what you're sending is one chapter, right? And if you feel like, you know, hey, chapter four is the exciting chapter, but it's not really ready yet, I want to send something polished, okay, fine, send the polished, less exciting chapter one, but then make sure that your dissertation advisor knows what's going to be in chapter four, so that he or she can say, you know, this may not sound exciting, but... Um. And I just wanted to add another, another information. I mean, that's, that's again, from, from my field at least. So, let me tell you, typically uh, we, we will be reading about very closely after an initial screen due to the letters. We're still going to be reading probably 120 applications. And when I say reading, I mean reading. Uh, we, everybody, at least one person or typically two in the search committee will have read uh, each of these sh uh, long listed, uh, listed papers and then we meet and we discuss the idea in the paper. So basically the letters and your CV need to be <coughs> outstanding as a necessary condition for us to do the reading but there's still a lot of outstanding people out there and so my, my sp um, uh, Thanksgiving holiday <laughs> the past three years have been ten hours of reading <laughs> a day uh, and that's um, and that's I think is encouraging in the sense it tells you that ultimately all the effort that you're putting in writing the I mean for us the job market papers in the main ch chapter of your dissertation that is an effort <coughs> that will pay off because committees read and committees care about the ideas in the paper and they're going to discuss about those uh, that being said to get that chance you still need to have outstanding uh, everything else needs to needs to uh, work out, but uh, but ultimately, at least uh, in my experience, the quality of your <coughs> dissertations was going to get you the interview. So I think one of the elements that can make any job application stand out is publications, right? And so a couple of people asked how important exactly are publications when it comes to applying for jobs, and does it matter more to have one application in a really stellar journal or to have a couple of, of um, of publications. So is it more about you have sh to show that you've made one very good intervention or that you've made interventions in a couple of different mm -hmm. areas? So what would really make someone's application stand out? And of course it's not necessarily one or the other, but I'd be curious to hear your take on that. Well, of course, the, 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 we made an offer to a candidate who sort of examined multiple publications of outstanding quality in mm -hmm. multiple top journals, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice it to say, this mm -hmm. candidate had offers from every top university in America, right? right? <laughs> so then what, what, what happens below that? Uh, it, it helps <coughs> to have a really good publication in a good journal. Now, not all publications in good, not all publications in good journals are, are actually good publications. There was one candidate, <laughs> in fact, who I, you know, were going through the pile, I said, oh, look, you know, this candidate has a publication in, you know, one of the top journals in the field. And uh, you know the other committee members, the faculty said, "Well, you know, it's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty crappy publication actually. And it's, you know, this mm -hmm. person lucked out, and you know, mm -hmm. we have no interest in hiring this person actually." So mm -hmm. I would say, like, it would seem to me that like mm -hmm. you want to you want to 
publish really good pieces and if or you have a really good job market paper, you want to have high quality above all else, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't do you as, as much good as you think, at least from my experiences, to have a mediocre to bad paper, even if it somehow lucks into a top mm -hmm. journal. So people will actually read applicants' um, publications, go out and oh sure, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. In addition to the materials they send in, yeah, yeah, certainly. Once they get serious about people, yeah. mm -hmm. and I would say, you know, again, <clears throat> disciplines differ, but certainly in my discipline, where it's published is relatively unimportant, and that's partly you know, the only journal in the field, only two journals in the field, probably that everybody knows, are the American Historical Review and Past and Present. They both take under ten percent of what's submitted to them, right. and so that means you know, I don't know what the fraction is of graduate student papers that are submitted to them, but it must be really, really small. And beyond that, you know, the, the US historians don't know whether 20th century China is a better journal than late imperial China. They have no clue. So what's going to matter is that it's in print in something that looks at least vaguely respectable, and that it's, and that once they actually read it, they say, oh yeah, you know, interesting stuff. The name of the journal is not going to matter much unless you are lucky enough to get into one of the couple of journals that everybody knows. Well, in economics, uh, it's, um, it's not that common, I think. Uh, it's becoming more increasingly common for students to have at least one publication, but it's not something that we necessarily require. Obviously, it helps, and it helps tremendously if it's well published, I mean on a, on a well-known journal, and it helps even more so if it's co-authored with a stu another student or or it's a single author piece. But in general, it's still a very good good signal. Um, but again, at least for us, the the way to the goal the goals on the main chapter because that's the one that gets actually read is still and presented. That's uh, that's still very large. So I think maybe early on in the PhD is is great to work on projects that can be submitted and published by the time you go on the job market but the months leading up to to the actual applications at least in my field are best used uh, improving uh, what you're going to be talking about in your campus visits mm -hmm. and maybe we can uh, we can take that step further in the um, in the hiring process and talk a little bit about interviews and campus visits and I was wondering maybe on a fairly general level if you could say something about the do's and don'ts of academic interviews be it at a first round at a professional conference or during a campus visit, what are some things that would make a candidate stand out and what would make a candidate go instantly on the on the reject pile? If I can say, um, <coughs> keep it professional. At least, uh, at least say that that's my own perception. I mean, if you you are highly, you're going to be, you already are, but are going to be very highly trained people who have devoted. Uh, many years of uh, very productive years of their life writing their dissertation that's what you want to talk about not in your research or the persons you're talking to research in one-on-one -on -one meetings or the general directions of the field or the discipline of the profession but i think i mean obviously coming across as a uh, personable and kind is, is always nice but uh, but ultimately we're not hiring friends we're hiring uh, colleagues and uh, coming across as serious committed <coughs> and professional at every stage is, uh, is in my opinion, key. Mm -hmm. So that means you need to prepare, uh, prepare a lot for every for every stage. M practicing your interviews, thinking about, um, talk to people who went on the market in the past, get a list of questions from them, practice those questions, and study well um, the school you're gonna go on a campus visit for, and and really really invest because mm -hmm. it, it will pay off. Yeah, I would agree with that. A um, couple of things I would add, particularly, I think, at the pre-campus stage. Look at your own record critically and think about, you know, what's my weakest point? And is there a way that I can address it proactively? So just to give an example, I remember the AHA hold every year at the annual conference there's a workshop where basically we take one of the biggest ballrooms and at each table in the ballroom is sitting somebody, you know, faculty member who has experience in hiring 
and there's a sign on the table that says, you know, large public university or liberal arts college or whatever, and people who are interested <clears throat> in interviewing at those kinds of institutions come talk to you. Mm -hmm. So I've done this a couple times, and I remember getting this one guy, I think he was actually from U of C, though I can't <laughs> swear to that anymore. <laughs> um, in many ways, a terrific record, but he'd been in graduate school something like 11 years. And it looked on paper as if he'd had you know, fabulous fellowship support. And he had been on the job market like three times and had not gotten anything. And he was sort of asking, you know, so what gives, right? And you know, the, the obvious thing was that people were looking at him and saying, yeah, the work's really interesting, but if it took you 11 years to finish, how are you ever going to get the book done to get tenure when you're going to be teaching a whole lot more than you teach as a grad student? The problem with that question is that most people are too polite to ask it bluntly. So you need to look at your own record and say, that's what they're going to be worried about with me. And I better address it proactively because they're not going to know how to bring it up. And it turned out that in this particular case, the guy had a perfectly good story. His wife had a chronic illness. He had spent an enormous amount of time taking care of her. It was now cured, and he was likely to be able to work a lot faster in the future. But for some reason, nobody had told him, get out there and tell that story. And so people were looking at his records saying, God, 11 years. You know? <laughs> so again, look at your stuff, think, What's the question that they might be embarrassed to ask me, mm -hmm. but that they're wondering about? Make sure you address it if there is one. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about the questions you might expect, but I guess it's also interesting to, to think about the questions you might not get, but that you, you would have to anticipate. But so I think everyone going into an academic interview will expect to be asked to talk about their dissertation, to talk about their experience with teaching. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit about the kinds of questions that might be a little more surprising perhaps, the kind of questions you might not anticipate but that you, you would do well to anticipate, other than the very generic big picture questions? Or do the interviews really stick with those very... <laughs> no, there are, I think, some questions. predictable or fairly common and questions that you wouldn't think about. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the most annoying, I think, is the less elite institution that asks you, well, would you be happy here? Or why are you applying to our school? And you, you just want to reach out and shake those guys and realize, and say, don't you realize it's a job? <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. And the hidden thing that's often in their mind is, are you going to be looking to get out as soon as you get here? Um, and you know, we don't want to have to do this search again in three years. And you know, don't lie, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, don't, if you can't pull it off convincingly, don't say, you know, I have always wanted to live in Camden, New Jersey, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just, it's not going to be convincing. <laughs> but you know, if there is, you know, be prepared for that and be prepared to say something about, you know, I came from a less privileged background myself. I really like the idea of teaching first generation college students. Or, you know, I'm from a small town. I like the idea of being in a small town. Or, you know, you can say, look, I don't know for sure that this is where I want to spend my whole career, but I think it seems interesting and blah, blah. But, you know, it's a terribly unfair question, but it comes up all too often, so be ready for it especially if you come from Chicago? Uh, so what I observed is that actually, uh, ev I think every candidate, we brought out something like 12 or 14 candidates across the two committees made a mistake according to the faculty in, in their interviews, uh, which was that there's a question, you know, what, what sort of courses do you want to teach, right? And uh, you know, what, at the graduate and undergraduate level, and, uh, and everyone apparently answered essentially some version of "I want to teach my dissertation," right? Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is that senior faculty are not looking to hire at the junior level people to teach their dissertation, right? Senior faculty would really like course coverage in the intro classes, right? So, you know, 
God knows when I'm on the uh, you know political science job market, I'm going to volunteer. I'd love to teach that intro class, right? Like that class that you're so sick of teaching for 25 years, right? <laughs> like that's and apparently every candidate made this mistake. Mm -hmm. You should say, you know, if there's a question about teaching, from what I gather, say it. You know, obviously you do want to teach what you what you're an expert in, but also you'd be happy to teach these intro classes that as the senior faculty probably want to wash their hands of. Yeah. So yeah, one one point that right reiterates the. Both uh, both things were, were said so far. Is, I mean, since we know that the market can, is uh, especially at the moment tight, and there's a lot, often many more applicants than jobs, be humble and show that you're willing yeah. to work hard and meet their needs. Ultimately, they're the ones with the with the position to fill, but but you need the, need the job. And so, I think uh, I mean, obviously, which it doesn't mean you need to sell yourself uh, short. I mean. Uh, you coming in, hopefully appreciate, liking your dissertation, <laughs> being excited about it, but you also want to be uh, humble and uh, and show that you want to to work hard to earn uh, earn your your position. I think I think that that's important. And then another uh, just type of question sometimes is asked, at least in economics, uh, which is a tricky one. I think it's asked quite. I mean, some of you might have heard it, but. We sometimes get questions along the lines of, oh, where do you think the field is going? Or where do you, uh, what's, what are recent papers that you think exemplify excellent work and, in this area? And so it's also a nice opportunity to take a step back uh, and, and think about uh, more broadly about your field, but be prepared for these type of, of questions because sometimes they're, they're asked. So I think the last question I'll ask before I open the floor is a question is, um, what is the best way of following up after an interview? I think we've all had this excruciating experience of having interviewed and then waiting, waiting, and there's nothing happening, and we just have the urge to email and say, "What's up? What can I con can I contribute anything more? Can I is there anything more I can do to convince you?" Um, so, is following up a good idea? What does good follow up look like to an interview? We only had an example of bad follow up where. Uh, the candidate was sort of on the bubble. We were, I don't know if this was bad. It just annoyed people on the committee and annoyed the leadership of the department. The, the candidate had done an okay job. Or we weren't crazy about the candidate, but you know, possibly we would hire this person if our first and second choices uh, said no. And this candidate kept us up to date constantly with emails about the status of his search with other places. I've been offered a job here. I've been offered a job there. They're meeting me at this department. You know. Like enough, right? Like we, you know. So I would say too much follow up is, is probably a bad idea, right? And don't and be humble, right? Don't don't assume that simply because you're getting offers from school X that you're going to get an offer from school Y, even if they're equivalently ranked or something like that. Yeah, I would second that and say only inform the department about an offer somewhere else if it's really germane to your decision making about them. So if it's really the case, you know. Place A has offered me a job. I would prefer your job if I could get it, but you know theirs is a job, and they're telling me I have two weeks to decide. Yeah. Then absolutely, yeah. tell yeah. people. Yeah. But if it's just you know, you know, I wanted to inform you that I got got an on campus at Vanderbilt. Yeah. Exactly. Whoopee! Right. Right? <laughs> you know, you know, they just don't. One thing I would say though, and this is much more casual and episodic, but sort of informal follow-up can, I think, often create the sense that you would be a good colleague, right? So if in the course of discussion you mention, I don't know, you know, a paper in your subfield and one of the people on the committee says, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know about that, and it roughly parallels something that I'm interested in in this you know, totally different time and place, then I think it could actually, if it's not too much work for you, send the guy a PDF. It's an excuse to contact mm -hmm. him that doesn't sound like you're pestering, but sort of says, you know, here's that Smith article I mentioned. You know, I'd be curious to get your um, impressions. Probably they'll never send you back their impressions, but they'll get the, mm -hmm. they will get the impression, this person follows up, this person remembers what was interesting to me. That sort of stuff is good. But other than that, I would actually keep follow-up to a minimum mm -hmm. unless there's something, unless you get to a point where you really need to know what they're thinking. Yes, I absolutely mm -hmm. agree. I wanted to add to your, mm -hmm. last, uh, to your last point. 
if there is a case, and hopefully that doesn't happen in, a, in all your interviews, and actually it happens early, but if there is a case where you're asked a question and for some reason you're caught off guard, you don't have a good answer, um, and you think the circumstances are appropriate given the type of question, you can send a follow-up email later on and say, you know, I thought uh, more about your question and this is, say, this is the assumption in my model that uh, drives uh, the thing you're asking mm -hmm. me about and I wasn't really able to, uh, to com if I wasn't able to convey that, let me just clarify. I think that, but again, it shouldn't be the norm, but I think sometimes we appreciate seeing that the candidate is not saying, oh yes, I'll get back to you and then never does, for mm -hmm. instance. That's, uh, um, and then the other thing that could be different useful is keep your advisor in the loop at every stage. You probably know that already, but you know, your advisor might be talking, I mean, especially I say at the big uh, conferences of your disciplines, they all run, we all run into one another. Uh, they might uh, they might want to know how your interviews are going. If there is a school that you really liked, and maybe your advisor is having drinks at the end of the day with uh, someone in that school, and can just mention, "Oh, my student was very excited about the interview." That you know, that's not going to make it happen. But I think it's important that uh, that you keep your advisor in the loop, uh, and it, it shouldn't be him or her sending you an email saying, "How did it go?" <laughs> you know, you want you want to be proactive about that. Actually, if I could just piggyback on something you said, <clears throat> which is one place where I think follow-up is often particularly useful is when it comes to teaching questions. Because very often, particularly again, if you come from UFC, because our undergraduate curriculum is somewhat unusual, right? very few of you will have experience teaching 200-person big survey classes, because we don't do very many of them but they're the bread and butter of state institutions. If they ask you sort of, well, how would you teach the such and such survey? The ideal thing, of course, is that you know off the top of your head how you would do it, even though you've never had to do it. But there's a good chance you won't. And that's the kind of, and there will be some suspicion of you as when you know, whether you're suitable for that institution, because the candidate from Berkeley also comes from a very good school, but it's a school where they do teach the 200-person survey. Mm -hmm. So that's a case where I think it would be really appropriate to a week later send an email saying, you know, I was thinking about your question about how I would teach you know, U.S. history from the very beginning to the Civil War. You know, here's my rough idea of what a syllabus would look like, or at least, you know, Here's what my course abstract would look like, because I think I'd want to emphasize you know, these three themes. Those sorts of things, I think, can help a lot. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'd like to open the floor to questions now. Yeah, on the issue of stuff to explain, if you have a similar issue that your student has, just that you maybe have taken long to finish, but there isn't sort of an, a sort of smoking gun, like my wife was sick or I was sick, it's a con occurrence of factors that kind of collide and maybe you had a slump in year three or four mm -hmm. graduate school and you recovered and that shouldn't necessarily determine your future productivity. But how do you explain it without it seeming either like excuses or psychobabble or <laughs> there's just a lot of stuff happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is a, a, an issue. I mean, I think, you know, without knowing the specifics, it's hard for me to craft an answer. But I think there are ways of doing this even almost in passing. So, yeah, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, though I originally had a different dissertation topic which did not pan out, since finding my current topic, you know, things have been going extremely well and da 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 da, da. Or, you know, whatever. Um, Would you do it formally in a cover letter or, or just make it? I might. I mean, it, you know, again, it depends sort of how much it stands out, right? 11th year really stands out. Yeah, I think more like 9, 9, 10, that, that sort of yeah, I mean, <laughs> hard to say, but, you know, I think to the extent that you can mention, even if you, you know, by mentioning it in passing, one of the things you do is you give them a license to raise it, and it's better, if it's going to be a potential problem, better that it be raised than not raised. So, no, don't go on for, you know, paragraphs of your cover letter <laughs> about, you know, you know, oh, you know, third year, everything went wrong, you know, my dog died, I do, da, 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 da. But if you can say, 
just, you know, again, just in passing, mm -hmm. I've been here a little bit longer than I originally planned because of some personal difficulties at an early stage in my career. Um, since completing my orals, I have been, you know, moving along swiftly, blah, blah. Something like that's not a bad thing. Um, well, at least in economics, uh, we often uh, check, download the paper directly from the person's website because we know that a lot of edits might happen <laughs> in the three, four weeks uh, between when the jobs are officially due and when the actual interviews are finalized. So, yes, you want to have a simple website uh, with, all the with the most updated version of all the papers that you're comfortable people reading. If you're posting something, you're implicitly saying this is ready to be read by a committee, so don't over post. Um, and so, yes, I think that's, uh, that's certainly a good idea. But keep it simple and to the point. Mm -hmm. I also think websites are helpful insofar as they can sort of just get your name out there. Uh, at least in, in political science, the, the, sort of the, the, the creation of the long list was in some sense all, was also motivated by, you know, I've heard of this person or you know, I've heard this person's name mentioned, you know, maybe I've seen their website, I know of this person, you know, in all the members of the committee would, would flag this, you know, would flag out applications and, you know, maybe they'd seen the website, maybe they'd seen them at a conference, etc. But sort of being a presence in your field I think is super helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah, I if you have any advice in general for candidates who are uh, quite interested Practice, practice, practice. I mean, I think that's really the first thing. Um, you know, it's amazing how easily we forget that people outside our field just have never heard of certain things we take for granted. Um, so, you know, try out, again, try out your abstract on people, try out your job talk on people. Um, but I also think it, it in terms of figuring out how you present yourself, it's partly a matter of the institution, right? Certain places will actually be really happy with the idea of somebody who's on the borderline of two or three disciplines. Um, you know, a lot of less prestigious places nowadays have a department of history, political science, and sociology. And maybe they throw an anthro too while they're at it. And those aren't always bad places. Right? But they're small. Um, other places you know, are going to be very different. Um, again, you know, make sure that you know you know who you're talking to and check check for jargon, check for hidden assumptions. Um, it's really crucial, I think the interview stage especially, you never want to inadvertently make somebody on the interviewing committee feel bad because they are likely to project that onto you even though it's not your own fault. And one of the ways that you can make an academic feel bad really fast is if it seems like you take it for granted that everybody should know something that they don't know. Um, so, you know, Better to over-explain than to under-explain. Yeah, yeah. The, the, we, had, we had two applications from uh, from highly ranked economics programs uh, that made no attempt to situate themselves within the discipline of political science, right? So if you're applying outside your discipline, if you're applying for some kind of transdisciplinary program, at least be aware of the fact that people who are reading your application have you know, come with a certain literature and a certain set of questions that they're interested in asking that are related to that discipline. You know, so. It seems obvious, but again, people don't do it. So don't just submit your poli sci application to the history department, right? Or, you know, whatever. It's not a good idea. And at least in our field, and this is also not necessarily for truly multidisciplinary work, but work within economics across the several fields, there's often um, the question about or who is this person going to talk to the most in the department and so on. 
And so at least this is what I was told when I was uh, searching for a job, is the famous question, what are you going to teach, is actually a good way to state in some sense where you see yourself. Uh, and you know, as I mentioned, you want to teach anything that they will <laughs> ask you to teach, but <laughs> you probably have some, uh, some expertise in some area, and so that could be a way to, to guide a little bit the thinking of, uh, of the department. Yeah. We don't really but read. Yeah, yeah, read if, if you're asking, yeah, if you're, some of my colleagues, I think, read them pretty carefully. I'm one of those people who could never figure out what they meant, right? We, no one, to my knowledge, has ever turned in a teaching statement that said, oh, well, I believe in passive learning, and you know, I love to hear myself talk, so I forbid participation, right? Everybody knows the buzzwords. Where I have often found where teaching materials have made a difference is there's a sense of concreteness that can really matter. So rather than spending a lot of time fine-tuning a teaching statement, I would be ready with answers to questions like, so if you were teaching the survey, what are some of the books you'd assign and why? And the best possible answer to that is always, well, I've already taught the survey, and I assigned X, and here's why I would use it again, and here's why I wouldn't. Second best, if you can't honestly say that, is I TA'd in the survey, and they used book X, and I found that the strongest students did well with it, but weaker students needed help with Y and Z because that book isn't that good at explaining those things. Failing that, I would say it's, yeah, you know, I've thought about that and it seems to me that two of the themes I would want to emphasize are A and B, and for those a good book might be da-da. But again, the more you can be specific, um, I think the, the better they like it. I just want to mention that the Chicago Center for Teaching has some resources to help you with the uh, statement of teaching philosophy. I think they regularly do workshops and I believe also one-on-one -on -one consultations specifically on writing a statement of teaching philosophy, so you might find that helpful. This might be very field uh, specific. So in some disciplines you will uh, graduate, wait to go on the job market, apply for postdocs, and then um, go on the job market uh, exposed. And that's some in economics that, that happens too, but what happens now quite often is also you will have a job and then you will defer it. And so that, I mean, an obvious pro of, uh, of a postdoc in general is that it will give you time to concentrate on your research uh, if you and you know being able to submit your dissertation for publication before you start teaching is helpful whether or not you already have a job lined up or or not so um, at the same time I think uh, eventually it's also I mean being part of a department and is can also be a great uh, opportunity to to learn uh, things that you might not necessarily learn as a postdoc. So in, I always tell my students there is an optimal amount of postdoc that, and that it's probably more than zero, but less than five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, I think it's definitely something worth considering uh, it, whether or not you already have a job, um, but it has to be, it's field specific. So you, it's something you probably ought to talk to uh, your advisor about. Um, uh, the ability to follow up uh, on a promise. 
services, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what other kind of things uh, would seem like I would want this person to be a junior college professor? Uh, I, I think it probably also depends on the institution, right? So. Mm -hmm. So the, the faculty meetings about the various candidates that we saw, the question was, is this person the smartest person of all the candidates that we looked at, right? And it's like a, such a you Chicago question, right? But like, God knows, I don't think that's the case. I mean, it can't be the case of every institution. Uh, I mean, the thing that I always have heard is collegiality. Uh, at least for us, that, that did, I mean, I think maybe more so than the economics culture, that would, we, we would rule people out for being for lacking in collegiality and affability generally. Or we did move people out for those reasons. I've never, well, I've never heard anybody explicitly ruled out for lack of affability. Um, we didn't, I, yeah. I, I assume yeah. that it happens, you know, in people's heads. So the, but there, was a, there was a candidate who was very, very promising on paper. Mm -hmm. And he'd been languishing on the job market for years, and I, you know, so of course I found his application. Or whatever, and I said, "Well, we gotta hire this guy. Look at this. Look at this application." And the advice said, "Oh no! Like everyone knows, that this guy is brilliant, but he's a he's a jerk, right?" So that was that. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. It, it can happen. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'd say to slight <laughs> variation. Don't be jerks. <laughs> yeah. The slight slight variation is, I think, what a lot of institutions are looking for, and obviously, yes, it does vary. You know, between a Chicago and a teaching college, but they're looking for somebody who's going to make the department better, whatever that, whatever that may mean, right? And at some places, that means they're looking for an exciting undergraduate teacher because they've been told by the dean, "You better get your numbers up, or you're in trouble." At a place that's more like Chicago, we're looking for somebody who. Their research is going to reflect well on us, and they're also going to make our our research better through their conversation. Um, and then other places will have still other definitions of what it means to to make the department better. But I think what most places are looking for is somebody who's going to have spillover effects. They're not only going to do good work for themselves, but they're going to help the department according to whatever metrics that department judges its overall success. I also feel that coming across as a, and, and it's something you know, you, that you can to some extent practice and work on, and so you, that it's a good thing to think about because it's partly within your control even in the short run, and it's coming across as articulate uh, is, very, is very important. So um, if, which means ultimately that both um, be, being able to answer questions uh, uh, in an articulate manner and have stimulating, interesting conversations at the campus visit, lunch or dinner, etc. Those are those are things that really make an impression. And, and so yeah, ultimately, I want I, s I know I might be getting lunch every day with this person, and I want those lunches to be stimulating and interesting. And so, when you're hiring a colleague, you want someone who's uh, not only technically very good and has great work and so on, but also an articulate smart person to talk to on a daily basis.
this or that. So just curious. So I, maybe I can I I can try answer at least from the perspective of my discipline. The first uh, the first question is uh, eventually you you have probably a bit of both. And since you have some meetings that are going to be just an extension of an interview. Uh, for which uh, this for instance is often a very good uh, opportunity to talk about your work that's not directly in your job talk so we'll ask you listen I'm gonna see your job talk later today why don't you tell me about something else and so you want to be prepared to talk about other research uh, but in other cases it could be the other way around so the, the person you're talking to will start telling you about his or her work and you know there's nothing better than if you have any some nice idea <laughs> of what he could he or she could do just in general I mean Hopefully you are truly interested and so you don't need to <laughs> pretend, but in general, t make your best effort to be interested in what um, the person is, is talking about because uh, there's nothing you know, better than, uh, than discovering common interests and so on. So, um, so that's, that's regarding your first question. I, I, don't, I, I think I'll defer for the second one. Um, yeah, I would just add for the first mm -hmm. one, this is a case where I would really invoke my previous principle of don't try to psychologize too much. You don't know, right? You might be meeting with this person whose work seems utterly divorced from yours because he or she turns out to have an amateur's interest in your field, even though there's nothing in the publication record that suggests it. It could be that this is an extremely politically powerful person in the department, and the search committee chairs, you know, acknowledging nobody's going to get hired whom Smith doesn't like. So, Or it could be as simple as there was nobody else free between 10 and 11, and the <laughs> department secretary didn't want you cooling your, your heels. So you know, don't try to read too deeply. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what your second question was. Question about um, deans. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think in most cases, when you're being hired at the entry-level junior faculty, level, deans don't really matter. I mean, they matter if you do something hideous in the interview. Um, a friend of mine who was dean of faculty for arts and sciences at Michigan for years and had to meet every single assistant professor candidate, whether they were in chemistry or in English literature, you know, joked to me that after a while you're just checking to see if their socks match. Um, <laughs> There will be exceptions, so sometimes, you know, particularly at a small place that's looking to grow, they might in fact be saying, you know, this person is going to be in anthro, but I notice they do India. We have no other South Asianists on campus but there's South Asian money in the community. Could I turn this person loose as a fundraiser? Um, so sometimes there will be agendas like that, especially at smaller places where, again, there may be no senior faculty who fit those slots. But most of the time, I think, when deans meet with junior level candidates, it's strictly because there's some rule that says they have to. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you can hurt yourself by doing something really weird, but otherwise, don't worry. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's 1.15, so I'm afraid we will have to end here. Thank you all for coming, and a special thank you, of course, to your panelists for sharing their insights with us. Well, best of luck uh, yeah, for everybody. Luck.